You are now listening to the Big Beyond Belief Podcast with your host, Leo Costa Jr. Hey, this is Leo Costa Jr. coming from SeriousGrowth.com. Today we have on the show a gentleman named Ronnie DeChico. Ronnie, how are you? Good, Leo. Thanks for having me on. Hey, I, I'm, I'm going to take a, a leap here. DeChico, I assume that's a great Italian name. Just a, little, just a little bit. Holy shit. Hey, have you ever been to Italy? You know what? I, I haven't. You I haven't. haven't. And, and, and if it if it's the last day that I'm alive breathing, I'm going to make sure that I go. Oh, I got to tell you something. You know, when I was uh, back in my bodybuilding days, I did a lot of uh, um, traveling to do seminars in Europe. And I had been all around Europe, but never in Italy. But I ran across so many guys and people that, that were in Italy, and not one negative comment about Italy. They say everything was, oh, shit, you got to go there. It's great. And Well, two years ago, I went to Italy, finally made it to Italy. And, oh, my God, I, not only did I fall in love with the people, I fell in love with the whole country. I mean, it was just amazing. The, the gusto and the way those people live life, it's, it's intoxicating, man, you know? And it, uh, I can't wait to go again. So I'm, surp- I'm, I'm not really surprised that you haven't been there because it took me a long. I'm Portuguese. It took me a long time to get to Portugal. You know, I'd been all over, but Portugal, but okay. Italy, ooh, baby, I can't wait to go back again. Yeah, it, it, the cool thing is, my grandmother, and my grandfather are from ne- neighboring towns in Pajentro and Salmona, which is a Brutes region. So it's they're not that far from each other to go and find like where my relatives are and yeah, and find family there. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, which kind of brings me to this uh, this show. I, you know, I, we've we got introduced what about, about a month ago. And yeah, it was, it was a little bit, almost two months now. Two months now, time flies. And one of the things that struck me was that I there was an instant connection, at least on my side, and it's you know it has to do with um, I'm real sensitive to people who I think have they're authentic. And they also have passion. You know, in 1982, I was at a crossroads in my life uh, because I wanted to be a professional athlete and, you know, things went south. I ended up on a family dairy, which is kind of a a thing that happens to Portuguese kids all the time. You know, just kind of handed down. And but it wasn't what I wanted to do, uh, Ronnie. And I promised myself if I ever got a chance to do something that gave me that love like sports did. I was going to not question it and just jump. And I did that. So I found my passion, you know, and ever since then, I've lived my life by that, that gauge. I've gauged how, how much passion that I have for something. And then um, I go for it. And I, I sense that in you uh, from the times I've, I've talked to you. Uh, I've just I've noticed that you've been very passionate and authentic. And for me, it's uh, it automatically makes me want to do business with you, if that should be the case, you know. And uh, so I just want to let you know that on the front end. I don't know if you under- you really know that you come off that way, but you did with me. Well, that, you know, I was actually going to ask you, well, in response to that, it's, you know, like anything else, I think that comes more with age because you don't you're not so sure of what exactly you're passionate about other than whether it's almost an arrogant cockiness sometimes of like you think you're good at what you want to do and you you have an idea i think all young kids are like that at some point and parents are like well you have no idea yeah. what you what life's even about yet yeah. but how, how old were you when you realized like you didn't want to do that and you found your passion like was, around what age were you for you? it happened to me at 27 i was with two kids just, sure. you know, married with a couple of kids. They were a couple of years old. And, you know, I just knew that the the telling sign was like I, I didn't look forward to getting up in the morning and going to work. It was like a nightmare almost, you know. It wasn't in my blood. And, and I almost felt bad because in my family it was like it was supposed to be handed down to the next generation. And it was like, shit, man. I'm like almost, you know, because my, my parents were kind of old school. Portuguese old school. And I was like, I'm, I was almost like letting them down, you know, it's like the black sheep, but I couldn't deal with it. You know, I guess when you get enough pain uh, with something, you, I think that's the way humans are. We, we respond to pleasure and pain. And at that point I had so much pain that I just, I said, screw it. I got into weight training and the next thing I know the bug bit me and the rest is history, you know? So I was 27 years of age. I mean, now I understand why my first wife, freaked out when I said, oh, yeah, I'm leaving the dairy because that was, 
you know, it was pretty stable. And she says, what, you what? You're going to go do what? You know, personal training in the 80s in my, my town, it did not exist. You know, the closest place you could get personal trainers uh, was Fresno or L.A. or San Francisco, maybe Fresno. But I got into the sport of bodybuilding at that point. And running, it's the best thing I ever did. It's scary as hell. But I, I've never turned back, and it's been the best thing that's ever happened to me. How about you? What, what got you into – what was the first thing you did? It's interesting that you actually just – because and here's the reason why I'm going this direction real quick is because somebody had asked me not uh, – probably just in the last week or so, like, did you know what you wanted to do when you were growing up? I did and I didn't. I, I knew that it – you know, so when you're in, in grade school or high school, whatever, it's teachers, oh, so what do you want to be when you grow up? I always just knew that it wasn't going to be some nine to five in an office doing the routine kind of thing. Although at the same time, I wasn't sure exactly what it was either because I was kind of a dork in high school. I played in the band. I was more musically, you know, like driven, um, try to be, you know, always class clown, funny, you know, weird kind of humor sometimes. But I just knew that whatever it was going to be, that I just wanted it to be something where people look back and go, how the fuck did you do that? <laughs> how, how did you do that? Like, how did that happen? And so I've kind of like been able to look back and go and ask myself the same thing. Like, how the hell did you do that? Yeah. How did that happen? Yeah. In, in a lot of good ways. And I mean, and there's been a lot of crazy stories, but no, I, I, I knew I wanted to go and be some, some, something in the music industry. My parents pushed me more to be a lawyer because my grades weren't bad. I didn't really study in high school. It just kind of came to me naturally, so to speak. I kind of like worked my way through it, but I didn't have the discipline for college. I, 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 I knew I was kind of done after the, like midway through the first semester. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I quit. I ended up getting, um, I ended up working, um, part-time, uh, in a law firm, but right around that time. And I was real, still really young. I ended up getting my first record deal right away. No kidding. Now, when you say record deal, does that mean were you a singer at that point or in the band? I was one of the first white rappers to be signed. Really? Yeah. I did not know that. Obviously, I mean, I've only known you a couple months, so this is interesting for me. Yeah. Because I, I, I was going to yeah, ask so you that. I was signed to the legendary Sugar Hill Records, like Sugar Hill Records, out of Teaneck, New Jersey, and um, I. But I worked with a, a production company here in Pittsburgh, um, and. Um, from there, they got me signed to this label in Jersey. And, you know, there, I was around a lot of famous people who weren't famous at that. Like they were just about to be famous. And yeah. I still look back and go, Kid, me, Kid Rock was over there, but he wasn't called Kid Rock. Um, Naughty by Nature were my label mates, but they were called New Style instead of the, that was before they became Naughty by Nature. And, you know, on and on and on. Missy Elliott and Timberland and Jodeci and, you know, Guy and all these other, you know, um, new kids on the block and Bobby Brown and new edition. And you know, I'm around all of these different people and old school rappers, cool Mo D and the sugar Hill gang and DJ Rob bass and easy rock. And a lot of these guys, it's like, Hey, small town, white boy from Coriopolis, Pennsylvania. It's like, whatever, just kind of go with the flow. But yeah. I didn't have any guidance or anything like that. So, you know, bad management deal, bad record deal led to me coming back to Pittsburgh and getting into <clears throat> excuse me, DJing. And then that turned into writing and producing and remixing and learn, understanding more about artist development. And then that got me into marketing and strategic marketing to be more, more precise. And then into, you know, kind of doing it all now. Like yeah. Where I'm at. Yeah. And that kind of, that reminds me a little bit. You know, that's again, I, I, there's a reason for, I think you're, you're and I, you are connecting because we kind of have followed that similar path. When I first got into personal training, I had nothing to refer to. So it was all trial and error. And so I learned this thing from the, from the ground up, which is kind of what you're saying. Uh, in a way, you've learned it from being in it to a certain degree, and it just evolved into what you're doing today. So let me ask you, because this is one of the things that I had to learn early on uh, in what I was doing was, you know, what was your, when you got into the producing, or what you're doing right now, what was your, what was kind of the long game or what was your mission statement when you got into this? Like, in other words, what was so different about, about what you were offering compared to, I'm sure, several other people that are in the industry? 
You know, I, I, I didn't know because, you know, so just to elaborate, it, and this will help me kind of segue into that answer, but I grew up watching my dad on stage. My dad had records out in the 50s. He was a doo-wop singer and whatever, and that's one of the reasons why he didn't want me to get involved in it because he just knew that it was not an easy road ahead. Yeah. So, um, but I grew up as a musician's kid and, and watching, you know, and around other you know, my, one of my close friends is a, an amazing jazz pianist and just drummers and singers and on and on. And, um, but all I knew is I wanted to be famous or popular or perform in some way. Just wasn't sure how to do it, how to get there. And then once I started figuring out the steps and learning and understanding how the industry really works and the mechanics behind it, um, the politics involved, the, the time and dedication to not only either find and kind of nurture the talent or develop the talent, but also the relationships and then the financial backing that's involved in where to spend those dollars and how to market a certain product. So I didn't necessarily know that I needed an end game other than to me, success was going to be on how many records I sold or how many people came to a show because when, when, when you're not sure of the dynamics of that actual, that particular industry from a, a record label standpoint, so to speak, you're looking at it from the artist's perspective. And if you're not signed to a label that's pushing you out there, you don't understand the magnitude of what needs to happen, whether that's tour support or radio support or, mar- you know, marketing and, you know, on and on, all the, all the details that, that they get wrapped up into that, that artist package. You're just looking at it as like, okay, there's Michael Jackson. That's ridiculously successful. Here's so-and-so. Well, they're kind of almost that successful, but, you know, so you kind of gauge it from that, but just the end game is to be famous or successful. So how did you go out and like when you first started, how did you, how did you go find your client? Well, for what I'm doing now, they found me. I mean, I think it was more of the idea of like, because in, so you know, I'm originally from Coriopolis, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I DJed at pretty much every club that it, it was in existence at some point or another, yeah. or had gone and performed at, or danced at, or hung out at. And so DJing and then using the money that I made from that to get my, have my own studio and then start writing and producing, then it was just a matter of like bumping into different artists at different studios yeah. and then collaborating with them. And then branching out from there and just kind of networking and then going to different, um, you know, um, industry functions like, you know, there's a promo only expo that's, that happens every year where radio and, um, you know, record labels and executives meet to promote and network and, and um, you know, interact with each other. Um, there's other, there's the DJ Times Expo and, you know, so just going to those events you know, in the winter music conference in, in Florida every year, those, those events allow you to network with other people in the industry. Yeah. So then, you know, you get to hear from so-and-so and then somebody gives you a call and says, Hey, how'd you like to partner up and remix? You know, you play, you produce, I have the, the clients from this label, you know, I can bring us work. And so you partner up. And so then you start building a name for yourself. Yeah. Um, and then from there, you know, then you go to the other different events um, where there's kids that are basically auditioning their talent. And then, you know, they know, oh, oh, Chico's done, or, you know, Ronnie, Ronnie's remixed for Katy Perry and Hillary Duff and Rihanna and all these people. That's somebody that I would want to hire to help me or my kids. So then you start working with those clients and, you know, they're developing their talent and, you know, it, 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 it builds from there. Yeah. So. Same way with me. I mean, the, one of the best uh, pieces of advice I got when I first started was a guy said, look, when you first start doing what you're doing, because I, the, before I ever started training people um, as a client, I had, I had to learn it firsthand for myself. And that's the reason why, I mean, I got into training because I ended up, I was an athlete and from one day to the next, I was a fat ass and out of shape and I had to do something before I was going to die, you know? So I, I started uh, working out and, and one thing led to the other. So I had firsthand information like that. Uh, and even to the point where kind of like with you, you know, you're out there DJing and you start becoming known for that. I'm assuming to a degree and it kind of leads you to these people. It's just like when I was in the gym, 
uh, you know, training for uh, bodybuilding competitions, well, people always come up and ask me questions. And that's what got me thinking, you know, maybe, maybe at that point, because I was still working on the dairy. I, I wasn't sure exactly how this was going to work out. But I thought about, for all these people that are coming to ask me questions, maybe I could do something with this. And that's when I got into the, the personal training sure. thing. Well, you're a walking billboard. Yeah. Like that. I mean, you're walking around with the results of what it is that you do. So it, you know, from my perspective, it's a no brainer to be able to market that or package that up or somebody comes up and says, Hey, how the hell did you do this? Yeah. Just like, I said, how the hell, how did that happen? Exactly. Well, I could tell you Yeah. and you package it up or you could write a book or you could put it in a, you know, a one sheet or you could sit down and do a seminar or you could bring people in and train them personally, or you could hire a few assistants and then have them teach your method and on and on and on. And it's, it's no different. I think than in any industry on how to like set that up, it's, it's more of the, the mindset of, okay, I, you know, I could sing or I could rap or I could write or I could produce or I could program or I could play. But if nobody knows that, it just stays contained in a, in a closet, so to speak, yeah. in my own studio. So if I don't get out there and go to these conferences or talk about myself or nowadays, right, social media yeah. and everything needs to be, you know, in real time, everything needs to be Instagram, everything needs to be Twitter or Facebook or whatever. You know, we didn't have that earlier on. So it was in-person networking, right? right. These, a lot of people don't understand the fact it's like, Look, you have to shake hands with people. You yeah. have to look people in the eye. You got to talk to them. You can't do everything through text or email or whatever, you know, unless it's minimal and it doesn't need to warrant an in like an in-person conversation, you know, like the stuff that we potentially going to be working on. You can't do that stuff through an email. You can't do that stuff through a text message. Yeah. That much bigger uh, that's a much bigger call for having the kind of dynamic and the conversations and the interaction and then talking about opinions and working through things and ideas and, you know, s s cutting off fat here and adding things there and, and so on and so forth. But, you know, yeah, you have to get out there and, and shake hands with people and have people come to your shows or go to these conferences. Hey, this is who I am. Or, Hey, how did you do this? Hey, I know that you were on this record. Do you ever need anybody to program for you? Let me know. Hey, if you ever need anybody to, you know, and so then your results kind of start speaking for yourself. Yeah. And the more your stuff gets out there, especially in the music industry, people start to listen and go, wow, those vocals are really cool on that track. Who did that? And then somebody was, oh, that's, that's Ronnie or, yeah. you know, Chico. I go by Chico. Yeah, Chico. Okay. The, oh, that's Chico's work. Oh, okay. Well, shit. You know, we've got problems with this engineer who can't, mix these vocals properly or doesn't have that kind of sound. We really like the way those vocals sound on this record. Let's hire him to mix these vocals on this album. So it all sounds, you know, uniform yeah. or they, they all have the same kind of presence or, you know, uh, detail to it, yeah. right? the personality to it. So, to speak. so yeah, I mean, with anything you've got to, I like to say I'm a networking whore. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things that I like about uh, talking to people who have, um, come from different walks of life is what I'm learning is as I've gotten older. In fact, I, I tell this now to the youngsters that are all around me at my gyms and, and places like that is that things, even though things are from a different walk of life, like in this case here, uh, things are, are more different, are more the same than they're more the same than they are different, you know, cause we apply the same sort of uh, strategies for like in this case here, you went out and did, your thing that way. My, the friend of mine that told me to go out and he said, start with friends and family because that'll give you a chance to start honing in your, your craft. And they'll, you, you got friends and family, hopefully that trust you a little bit. That'll, that'll at least be willing to work with you. And it gives you a chance. It's kind of like comedians when they go out and they have new work that they're doing, they go out and they try it in, in different venues, smaller venues before they go out and, and hit the bigger, bigger markets, you know, and I'll tell you what, Ronnie, and the thing about what I learned is believe, unbelievably, I mean, I got into the sport of bodybuilding and, you know, I was up in front of a bunch of people. But in, when I got out of college, I was, uh, 
you know, I wasn't very outgoing. I, I was afraid about in front of a crowd. I mean, I, I dropped classes in high school and college when I could not to do any kind of presentations. But when I got into my own business, I'll tell you what, it was if I didn't do this, like what you're saying is get out in, in front of people and start telling people about what makes my deal unique. Well, this would have never happened. And you're absolutely right. But it's amazing what someone can do when there's enough when you're scared shitless, you can do a lot of stuff. I mean, I had to do something because I had a, a wife and two kids at that point, and mm-hmm. I certainly didn't want to let them down. So I got over a lot of those fears. But man, it's a you know kind of a scary deal when you're first going out there and and trying to figure this thing out. Because uh, like I didn't really know in the very beginning. I didn't even know what to charge people because I had people asking me uh, in my town, uh, personal trainer. What is that? A uh, a uh, an aerobics instructor. You know, how in the hell can you make a living doing that? I mean, that's a good question. And yeah. that started forming my unique uh, selling points, you know, as far as what I really was. And then it was all about pricing. I mean, how did, how did I know what to charge? Did you know what to charge when you first started? Was there an industry standard? Did you just kind of figure it out as you went? Yeah, you know, it's actually an, an interesting concept. All, all I could say is, you know, there was there was probably a time – that I, I could definitely pinpoint to where I was nervous to even ask a question. It was just very intimidating in a lot of different ways. But then I learned as I got older to basically say, you know, fuck that. Like why, why we can only allow people to make us feel that way. We yeah. don't have to feel that way. So stop being afraid to ask questions or speak up or say whatever's on your mind, because at least people can respect you for, for standing for something or asking a question or wanting to know something when it came to knowing what to charge or figuring it out. I mean, you ask a couple of people, you know, Hey, you know, what, what, what somebody like this get, you know, there's a couple of written rules, especially in the music industry that or unwritten rules, I should say, you know, we don't, we don't discuss age. We don't ask people, you know, what their sexual preferences are or politics or things like that. And we never ask anybody how much they make on things because there's always a weird kind of vibe. Unless you're working in conjunction with somebody, there's a way to kind of like dance around that or massage that that conversation, so to speak. But I always have said, um, and, uh, you know, I got this, um, I've had this mentality even before I worked with like Shark Tank and Mark Cuban and GNC and on and on to not be afraid of a number. If somebody else doesn't like the number, they can always come back and say, well, how do you justify that? Or why is it that number? Or, you know, oh, okay. I mean, you know, because you never know what the other person's going to say. And you don't ever want to not value what it is that you do. And I learned a long time ago to look at things and go, well, wait a second. If something's really that cheap to do, everybody would be doing it. Yeah. So – It can't be that cheap. Or if it's that cheap, is somebody really going to give me a good quality product? Or, you know what I mean? And there's, there's ways to not overcharge people or drain somebody's pocketbook and build a good relationship. And again, you're talking short term, long term, right? Is it just a one off? You know, is there going to be additional revenue potentially down the road? So those things kind of like come into play for me on what, what I would charge based upon what I'm doing. When I first started, you know, I just, I picked the number. I thought, well, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to charge this much. And I will tell you now that it was on the lower end, but I learned a really good lesson. A couple of them, you know, back then was that um, my prices at that point were not high enough because what happened was when something happened, if somebody had their refrigerator break or a car went down, I was like the first person that went. You know, I was a total luxury at that point. And what was really hard to do was actually increase my prices. And then and, and here's what I learned. I, and like you said, you can increase yourself right out of the ballpark. But when I basically doubled my price, all of a sudden I started getting a better, a better client. Someone who, you know, I wasn't this guy with the, I was the first one to go. They actually wanted me. This was something that was really important to them. To the point that they didn't, you know, I wasn't the first one to go. So I learned a lesson there, you know, and that's when I started 
Really, and even from the start, you know, my goal in the very beginning, um, and, and even today, was when I work with a client, it was always about giving them the greatest and the best workout they've ever had. I always try to remember that each and every time, which is hard to do because you get in a. Sometimes you start getting in a in a routine, and that routine can be deaf to your your evolution because you forget about those certain things that are always going to be uh, the basic staple, you know, and I still remember that. I mean, I want to make sure no matter what that I give that client the best workout that I can possibly do because all I can do is my part, you know, and I have to, obviously they have to be a part of that process. And mm-hmm. so I learned that. And I also learned in my business, uh, I, I, at, at first I was waiting for, I, I would charge by the workout. So they say, okay, well, I'm going to buy 12 sessions. I wouldn't, I wouldn't collect my money till after the 12 sessions were done. And I learned, you know, then that uh, I needed to change that to they need to pay up front. Psychologically, when somebody pays for something up front, they feel like they have to use it. And, you know, it was all those little things that created a, a, a longer term relationship. And of course, once you once a person saw the result that you said that you were going to get to them, well, that just made you uh, somewhat of a uh, an expert in the industry. And that's how that's how I built my uh, my uh, reputation a- along with going out to service clubs at that point because I had to get the information out and there wasn't any of this uh, like there was today with the social media and that kind of thing you know so I had to force myself to get out there but Ronnie I'm going to tell you something it was one of the best things that happened to me because it made me come out of a shell and learn that you know I can do this and well, like like you said there there's I mean you can be a you know you can uh uh, be nervous about something and be afraid, but it, most of the time it's not going to kill you. And once you realize that, it's like, oh shit, well, I'm just going to go have a good time and be authentic. And that's kind of what I've done throughout my, you know, my career. And I sense that you've done the same thing. Uh, one of the questions I, I would have to you because I I face certain um, certain uh, obstacles with my clientele is what's the biggest obstacle if there is one with your customer for you to make them successful themselves yeah <laughs> isn't that something that usually them getting in their own way yeah and it's usually out of fear or i mean you know bad habits can be can be worked around or supported by other things but it's usually themselves they You know, a lot of people set themselves up for failure before they even get started or they find an excuse to not let go and really put themselves out there to trust the process. Now, everybody looks at it as like, okay, well, we're talking about spending money here. Okay, well. That's a lot of money to take a chance on something that I'm not really 100% sure about, right? So I I think a lot of times those things, you know, they can obviously self-destruct before the product project even gets started. But we're also talking like, you know, if we're talking about a recording artist versus a client that has a product that needs to be placed or you know, um, somebody's writing a book and they want to turn that into a TV pilot or they want to turn it into a show or they want to, um, you know, book seminars or whatever that is and do, you know, like a marketing strategy for those things. Um, I, I, I venture to say across the board, most of my experiences have just been they get in their own way, yeah. whether that's ego, whether that's fear, whether that's, you know, insecurities. Um, which then lead to even more fear. Um, that's that's just a killer. Yeah. So what do you do about that? I mean, what's your solution to that? I'm sure that you know, most people are like that to begin with. So what's your, you know, what's your strategy for overcoming that and making those people productive to some degree? Well, I mean, like anything else, it's it's more. I mean, it's 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 educating them, and then building that confidence and explaining to them. Well, look, you're not the only person who's afraid. You're not the only person who's nervous. The other yeah. 500 million people who have records out before you that were all successful were nervous and fearful at some point in time. Yeah, you're not the only but, one, <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, there's that. Um, well, I'm not sure if you don't, you, don't, you don't realize this or not, but 
there's no way for me to be you. So I can do as much as you pay me to do or help you with, but at some point you have to be out there. So, yeah. you know, you can, you can spend all this time and all this money and want to do this, this, and this, and this, but if you can't make that step, nobody's going to know who you are. Yeah. You got to be a part of the process, you know? And one of the things I've learned too is when I, I think it all starts in, for me, it's in the consultation. When a client comes in off the street or whatever, you know, I sit down with them and, and I do a four minute consultation. And the whole point of that consultation is to fact find, because I like to hear, I like to get into people's minds and I'm really big into uh, nonverbal communication. I pay attention to, you know, how their you know, body language is versus what they're telling me. And it's really interesting, actually, when you get into that side of it. You know, it's almost sinful in a way, which I love. But um, one of the things I do is fact find to find out what their fears are. Because essentially, when they come to me, a lot of times it's like they've t tried this before on their own. They've worked with the other trainer, which is part of my fact finding process. And it's like I, I find out, okay, so how, how is it that you didn't, you know, why did you fail the first time? Or why didn't it work out for you? My mm -hmm. whole thing is to solve problems immediately to take all that, you know, out of, to take that fear away from them, or at least to give them that sense that, hey, they're dealing with somebody here that knows what he's talking about, you know? And that what that does for me too is also, I kind of put these people in, in a way, and hopefully in a nice way, I put them on an island because I want them to know that the only reason why, and this is actually the fact with me, the only reason why people don't normally sign up with me is due to lack of motivation or money. And I can't help them with that. I mean, you know, you, you have to be motivated to do the things that I'm asking you or, you know, telling you that you're going to have to do. You're going to have to put in three hours a week uh, to do this. You're going to have to be very consistent and that kind of thing. So I think this plays to exactly what you're saying. You know, you have to be a part of this process for this to happen. All I can do is give you the, the, give you the path to go down. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's amazing how many times I have to have this conversation and go, what, what are you doing? Yeah. What do you do? How do you not get this? Like, how do you, you, you say you want to be a singer, but you don't have a vocal coach or you don't want to work with a vocal coach. You say you want to be a musician, but you don't want to work with a, a you know, an instructor with whether it's, you know, teaching you a certain style or whatever, you know, Prince had a vocal coach up until the day that he died. Um, you know, Aretha Franklin, had a vocal coach up until the day, you know, all of these greats still continue to work on their craft yeah. and they put that time in, but you know, Justin Timberlake didn't just become as good as he was because he was in the Mickey mouse club <laughs> and because he got signed to NSYNC, he took it on upon himself to work when the lights went down or on his days off or taking that extra time. And he knew at some point, look, this band's going to break up and I'm going to be on my own and I've got to make sure I take advantage of every opportunity that I have to do it. You know, people like LeBron James or any superior athlete doesn't just work out with the team. When they're done or on their days off, they're working on the things that they know they could do better. They're continuing, continuing to hone their craft and battle those demons that, you know, whether it's a pitcher, think, you know, the a fearful, different situations and things like that. I mean, we could bring in a million analogies or a million yeah. you know, examples, but that's the biggest thing. And, you know, what's the old phrase? You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And, yeah. you know, on, on and on, you, you know, I, I tell people all the time, look, I could I could hire as many people to write a record or you do it myself. If, you know, if it's not my thing or if I, I'm not the strongest writer in the group bring people in to write it. If I'm not producing it and I'm not the strongest producer and we need a certain style that maybe is not my thing, or, you know, I just don't want to be the, the actual program or I'll oversee the whole thing and we'll bring all these people and I can build that whole entire project till it's ready to launch. And I can put the marketing in place. I can put the promotions in place. I can put, you know, some advertising in place. I can get the, the release done and get out there on so many different platforms but you have to be the person to pull the trigger yep. when it comes to getting out there and saying, hey, look at me. This is my record. Hear me sing. Watch me perform or do what it is that I do. Because at that point, I can't be you. Yeah. And that's like I tell a lot of people. I said, you know, what you, it's what you don't see behind the scenes. And that's exactly what you're talking about. And, and really, 
in, in that consultation, I try to be very straight and say, look, if you're not able to do these kinds of things, don't waste your time, my time and your money. And because they like the idea of it more than the actual reality of going through and having to do the work. <laughs> right? Yeah, this is why, like, even though you're in a, a totally different I, livelihood, it's the same shit that we're dealing with. I say that all the time. I said, everybody loves the sound of doing something. Everybody loves the sound of being famous or everybody loves the sound of doing this. But then when it really comes time to do it, where you at? Yep. Yeah, that's yeah. where it's all at. Oh, boy. And, you know. or, or as my grandmother used to say all the time, they just – you just love to hear yourself talk, don't you? <laughs> yeah, I actually do. Um, <laughs> so, so my, uh, I'm curious to know the Billboard hit. I know that you've had these. Is there a, uh, you know, when I, there's, a, is there a process? The, the specific question is: Is there a process to producing a Billboard hit? Well, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot there in that question, but, um. I get asked a lot of times because a lot of people don't understand when you say a uh, billboard hit this or this is on this specific chart or whatever. Billboard is a metric system in a, in a, in a platform or an, an, a basic landing spot that takes into account a lot of data, whether that be, you know, used to be record sales. Now it's downloads, whether that be streams on Spotify or YouTube spins and so on and so forth, or maybe there's an independent chart um like you know i'm a part of the billboard dance club chart that's a specific type of metric as well based upon so many djs reporting records that they're playing and so on and so forth so every chart has its own um its own pathway as far as what's being included in those numbers to elevate or to have you appear on those charts right one specific chart may be a combination of sales and spins and Another chart placement, they may take that into consideration and weigh those things out to get, you know, certain outcomes and stuff. But yeah, I mean, if your record is not being promoted, is not being promoted in the right way. In other words, if, or if I put a record out on you and that record just sat on iTunes or Spotify and, you know, you can also put music up on YouTube without a music video. And it was on the digital platforms there for people to listen to or download or whatever. If there's no specific promotion, then you're not going to appear anywhere. Yeah. Those numbers will just stay, you know, true to those different out, those different platforms. Yeah. If you, if you hire specific consultants or you go to promotion like top 40 radio and you're promoting to top 40 radio and you get so many stations to add the record and it's doing really well and it starts to grow, then you'll appear on certain charts because you'll be occurring, you'll be um, accumulating spins each week. And as those spins add up, the more spins you get, the more you'll appear on a chart. Yeah. Um, so those are how, those are the ways to get appearances or get placement on individual charts. But that's all based upon whether you decide to go that route. If you have a label pushing that, if you're an independent, um, you know, and there's a budget for it, you just, it's about, you know, pushing those dollars and that energy and those marketing strategies into those different avenues. Yeah. I tell me that some of these, tra I, I certify trainers as well. And I say, look, just because you're certified, you know, then you go hang up a shingle on your door out there. That doesn't mean this stuff's going to happen. You know, there's way more to it than that. And it's just, uh, you know, another hard reality, you know, uh, when, uh, so I come to you now, I'm a singer. I have all these songs and mm -hmm. I say, uh, you know, Chico, these are the songs that I've come up with. And these are the songs that I like. These are the ones I think are, are winners and hits. So, so what's that dynamic? Like, do you pick the songs for me or am I going to get the, how does that work out? Well, it depends. I mean, if you're asking me to come, if you're asking me, hey, look, I've got a product here. Um, I'm going to hire you as a consultant or, you know, basically overseeing or an executive producer for my my release. But this is the record that I think is what I want. 
Hey, look, at that point, you're the boss. Yeah. If, if you want me to, you know, if you want me to try to go a certain route, that's the way that I'll go. I'll advise you in the beginning and tell you, I don't think that's a strong record, but if you really want to make that work, I'll do my best. I can't. And, and like with anything, I can never guarantee anybody any, any success or anything happening. But I can tell you, if I, if, if I take a record that's not going to work, the, the people that we're hiring to do consulting and promoting and stuff like that, their jobs will be basically, you know, shut down because the record's not strong enough to compete in the marketplace. Yeah. So yeah. no matter how much money you have or how much money you think you can throw at something or use for different remixes to promote that end of it and stuff like that, if it's just not a great record and it's not going to work, you know, you're spinning your wheels. Now, if you come to me from the other side and say, do what you do, I'm, I'm leaving it up to you. If I don't have any songs that you think will work, then we'll start from scratch. You know, you tell me what to do. We'll write and produce something more, you know, original that makes more sense for what it is that I'm doing. And then tell me how much it's going to be to put all of this other stuff in place. You know, I can do that as well. Yeah. And, th and it's the same thing with any other concept. Like, you know, if somebody comes to me with a concept, like, hey, I have an idea for a TV show. Or, hey, I have an idea for a book. Or I have an idea for a live, you know, concert or show or whatever. Or, hey, I have an idea for, a, for a, a supplement and I'd love to get it into GNC and it's based on this, this, and this. Or I, I want to get it into, you know, all of the sheets across the country or whatever. I apply the same same thought process, you know. Yeah. Um Although with, with products and, st and, and whatnot, I always, it, it, it's kind of a catch 22 because yeah, I can have an opinion, but as I said to Mark Cuban's team, you know, when they asked me about one of the products, they're like, so what do you think about the product? Do you like it? And I was like, yeah, it's not bad. And they're like, you don't like it. And I said, well, it's really not my job to like it or love it because you want hundreds of millions and billions of people to like it, not yep. just me. Exactly. And I don't know a hundred billion people or a hundred million, hundreds of millions, let alone billions to convince them whether or not they're, they're going to follow my lead. Yeah. So they're not going to care whether I like it or not. It's my job to get them to like it. Exactly. And that's a whole different, you know, mindset. Hold it. Yeah. When I was, uh, as a trainer, I kept moving up the line and I started training different, again, different walks of life. And I trained Hollywood, uh, you know, the actors and, and when I trained the athletes, especially the pro athletes, I don't know about you, but you know, they were the, the biggest challenge for me to, uh, to train because those guys were at a level, they were kind of prima donnas in a way. And I could kind of see it the way they're, they're, they're treated up there. I mean, I'm not surprised that more of them aren't, but from my perspective, it was always a tricky deal because it's like, okay, you came to me uh, to be the strength training coach for you. In other words, the expert to make you better on the field. But you're trying to tell me what the fuck to do, you know? And, and that was a tricky balance because I could have got rid of most of them at that point. The, the, the athletes that were up and coming, those are actually, for me, they were hungrier in some ways. They would they would take your advice more often than the mm -hmm. pros because these guys have been and I can understand that it was like okay so that's that's the reality of that dynamic so how do I make them productive inside that dynamic you know that was always yeah. a tricky deal and it's it's like you said I said you know you're the you're the customer you're the client but at the same time you came to me for me to get you some results and and I tell you something uh, Chico a lot of times I had to take that stand. And I had a, you know, I, I, I usually would make those guys, I, I'd get them sick on purpose to get their attention because I'd hear, well, I never done this this way before. We used to do it this way. I had a coach back in college that said, I don't give a fuck what you did in high school. You were here now. And that was kind of the same idea. And so I, I had to get their attention by, by putting them over the rail, I called it, and they'd be, you know, throwing up all over the place. Well, now I got your attention, okay? We just wiped the fucking slate clean. And now we're gonna, and you know what? They actually turned out to be really great uh, customers at that point. But that's why I was asking you. I mean, I'm, I would assume that being in your industry, and again, this is an assumption that you would deal with a certain amount of drama and conflict with somebody who's, especially when you're writing a song, you're really connected and attached to that. And for somebody like yourself to say, hey, you know, I really think that, you know, it's a great song, 
But I think that this might, one over here might be even better, you know? And I would think that there'd be times where you'd have to like split that relationship. I mean, did you ever have to walk and just in that relationship at some point because of cre creative differences? Oh, a, a, a lot of times. Yeah. yeah. I mean, cause there's all, and, it, 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 and it's even not, I would probably actually say a lot of times more so than not, it's the unsigned artists that think that they know more because they don't want anybody changing what they do. Yeah. You know, God forbid. Oh no, this is good. No, I, I believe in this. This is this. So, okay. Well, and look, if I was Clive Davis, I wouldn't be, no offense, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now, Leo, right? If I was on <laughs> that level, it'd be a whole different ball. So I'm always learn. I'm constantly learning and growing and trying to be more successful and, and so on and so forth. But I'm also a very, like, in low, you know, entrepreneurial spirit of, like, building my brand and what I'm working on as well. So, you know, there's there's a, a huge sacrifice there, too, to, to you know, get, balance those two worlds out. Um, cause sometimes they don't fit together because when you're an entrepreneur, you're doing what it is that makes sense for you and taking that shot on what you believe in. And then there's the other side of where you've got to like balance out of what's best for the client or best for that particular brand, et cetera. And that doesn't always, that always doesn't meet in the middle. Um, but a lot of these younger artists and stuff like that, they just think they know everything. Yeah. And it's like, well, then what do you, why are, what do you, what would you call me for? Yeah. Well, what, so, what, what do you need me for? If you know, if you know, if you have all the answers and that record's a hit, why isn't it on the radio? Explain yeah. that to me. Yeah, exactly. And then they, they can't. Oh, well, I don't, you know, I don't really know anybody. It's like, okay, well, you don't know anybody because of that attitude. Yeah. Well, and that, and you don't know what you don't know. My dad used to tell me all the time, you're just too damn fucking young. You know, it's, it's not your fault. You're just, you got, yeah. there's a learning curve here. And sure. even, even like when I was, uh, you know, in the sport of bodybuilding at some point in the beginning, I had black and white answers. I knew for sure. This is how you train to get this way. And as I started learning and getting more experience underneath my belt, I realized that there were more gray answers than black and white, but that came yeah. through the experience. And then, man, when you're dealing, like you're saying, when you're dealing with somebody that, doesn't know what they don't know. It's a nightmare. And, and, and you, so you have that dynamic as well as the person that is like in these, these pros that I was uh, dealing with, they, they think they know everything because, uh, you know, well, that most of the time it's because they're getting paid millions of dollars. So that makes them the expert, but sure. uh, yeah, it's a constant, uh, it's interesting to try to make that whole thing, uh, work out. Um, so is there a, would you say there, is there a conversion rate? Like, you know, when so, you get so many, how many of these uh, singers or situations or projects do you uh, come to your sort of your on your doorstep? How many do you take, and how many can you do in a at a time? It well, there's there's not a set answer for that. Um, I have to base it upon, you know, how 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 involved am I really going to be? In other words, you know, how in depth do I have to get? Do I have to do everything for this this client? Can I, you know, outsource a lot of this stuff and just kind of like oversee it and not have to, you know, do a lot of babysitting with it? Um, so depending upon what that is, you know, you can only handle so much at one time. Yeah. And I don't take on multiple things because I don't have a huge, I don't have a staff. It's not like I've got you know, offices in New York and I've got a whole label available to me, you know, I'm doing everything more individually and kind of using a lot of their resources to keep costs down, but yet, you know, get the most results and, and figure things out. But, um, over the last, over the last three years, I've taken on maybe not including like remixes that come in from record labels, because that's not something that I have to really validate whether I'm going to do or not. Um, when it comes to new artists, um, the last three years, I've had three artists that I've taken on and launched and they've all been top 10, top 15 records. Yeah. How long does it take like, uh, to get to a top 10 or top 15? Is there like a, a kind of average time? Well, the last record that I did, well, my last record for my brand, 
uh, with the girl that I was talking to you about before the before the show. We started that. We started recording that in last July, and then it was it was launched in September, late late September, early October, and then it peaked at number eleven on the on the Billboard Dance Chart in February, February second. So about five or six months then. It was it was it was around that time from start to finish. Yeah. Now. There's been other projects. The last record that I just did that went to number five was February, February, March, April, May, June, July, August. Yeah, but I was about six months there too. Five, six months. Yeah. So it, 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 sometimes you can turn things around quicker depending on how much work's done prior to me getting on board. Yeah. Starting from scratch is obviously a whole different project. And then sometimes it takes a few months just to figure out what that record's going to be. If you don't have the one that you know you're going right out of the bat with, then it's a matter of developing that next record. So it could take, you know, depends on how fast it clicks, how fast. But prior to that, I worked with a younger artist and it took almost it took almost a year, a little over a year to get that that project up and running and and, and charted. And is that your the the person that you're the song uh, singer that you're dealing with or the band that you're dealing with is in the meantime are they out on the road all the time and I mean they have to make a certain amount of money to keep all this thing going too. Yeah, some of it depends. Um, you know, one of them was a dancer, so she, you know she had uh, you know she's working and performing and doing her thing until the project comes out. Yeah. You know, um, a new artist that I'm working with now, you know, he's um, he works a. Uh, uh, um, um, you know, a trade he is, you know, he is a trade and he works, you know, so many hours a day and then comes home and then works out and then rehearses and writes and then goes to sleep and then gets up and does it, do, you know, do it all again. Yeah. So we're working on that between, you know, what he's doing. Um, you know, this week um, I'm in Pittsburgh and then I go to Alabama um, and then I'll be back and then I go back out to Vegas again and come back. So, you know, in between all of those, those stops and starts and whatever, you know, for me, it's this, it, it's, it's kind of no different from them. I'm working on what I'm working on and then jumping back in to finish up what I need to finish or oversee. So yeah, yeah they all have different, different, unique situations. I mean, the younger kid when he was in, he was, he was only in grade, he's in grade school. So, I mean, he obviously was doing his performing arts school and whatnot and then recording when we didn't have class and things like that. So it's all, it all depends. Yeah. You know, so do you think that you'll ever get, I mean, again, do you, do you uh, you're mainly in the music industry. Is that correct? I, I don't know. I, I mean, I guess probably the majority of my work comes from the music industry right now. Um, but the opportunities are more across the board. Like I'm going to be working with, um, I'm actually going to be working with another bodybuilder about her story and packaging something up for her. Okay. Um, potentially, you know, we're obviously working with you um, and whatever other opportunities those bring. I don't, I don't, I see myself more as an overall, you know, consultant or yeah. facilitator. Yeah. Uh, and then I kind of, I, I pick and choose what I really want to be hands on with and what I know that I shouldn't be hands on with yeah. and allow other people to be hands on with or, call somebody up and say, Hey, look, this is where I'm at. This is what I need. What do you think? Yeah. And then allow that, you know, to happen. And that door to open up. I think it's important to, from my perspective, to know what your strengths and weaknesses are because, yeah. uh, you know, we're, the human nature, we're, human being is not really uh, good at multitasking too much. And sometimes you take on stuff that you shouldn't. And I think you, you got to know when to say, you know, I'm going to stay in this lane for the for the betterment of this project. But I, at the same time, I know with me, I like to expand. I like to stretch out there because one of the things for me is when I start getting too comfortable, I need it's time for me to stretch out and become uncomfortable a little bit. Uh, because it stirs up the creative juices and you know, this, the, even the stuff that you and I have been talking about doing here, possibly in this uh, next, it's, that's an exciting and scary adventure all at the same time. But that's the kind of stuff that drives me. Anyway, uh, exit question. Um, what's been your defining moment in your industry? My defining moment? Maybe there's more than one. 
<laughs> Maybe there's none. No, I'm assuming there is. Yeah, it sounds like you got a lot of uh, moments here. My defining moment. I've never had anybody ask me that. Ah, huh. original thought. What the hell? How about? Yeah, uh, how- I, I guess I would have to look at it as like, what was it that was defined? Was there anybody like that? Like, for example, when you went, uh, did you say you worked on the, uh, with Mark Cuban and the Shark Tank? Were you actually working on that show? Yeah. So my, my role with that was I had previously worked a couple of products to GNC and had, you know, relationships still do, um, with, um, being able to pitch or, you know, introduce products to companies like GNC, Vitamin Shop, you know, 7-Elevens, different, um, different brick and mortar stores throughout the country. Yeah. And it it just happened to be a unique situation where somebody was looking for an opportunity to either get on the shark tank or meet Mark um, about a product that they had that I had been representing and they wanted to expand on it. And so I had got an introduction to Mark through a close friend and um, that turned into them coming actually back and saying, Hey, you know, we're not, in, we're not interested in that situation right now, but we see that you have a relationship with GNC and these other things. Would you be able, would you be interested in representing some of the products that we're investing in on the short time? And so that's how I got involved with that. I wasn't on the actual TV show, uh-huh. but what I did was the product, the first product that I took on, I negotiated or worked out, uh, a, an idea of like, Hey, look, here's what we can do. I'm I'm just about positive. I can make this happen, but what would really sell it and knock it home is if we could get you guys to come in and film the follow-up episode in Pittsburgh, you know, the follow-up episode with the shark tank to your, you know, cause they do a follow-up on that product. Mm -hmm. If we could do that at GNC headquarters in Pittsburgh, we could really make something special. So I got that to happen. And, you know, so I was on, I was, uh, you know, behind the scenes and doing the helping with locations and scripts and, you know, presentation and product placement in the stores and kind of overseeing some things with the people at GNC and working hand with those guys and the, and the, and the film crew and whatnot. Um, you know, so that's, that's how that all came about. But um, I guess that could be a defining moment, but I don't know if that's necessarily the defining moment. Yeah. I would probably say my defining moment in my career, my life had to be more personal but the advice that I got came from somebody in the music industry. Yeah. And I was in a really bad place emotionally with a, an ex-girlfriend that I had actually had a hit record with. And that's too long of a story to get into. <laughs> I'm starting to feel your pain. <laughs> yeah. Well, but put it, put it this way. We had gotten pregnant or she got pregnant or however politically correct or un feminist or feminine feminist you want to be uh, because I'm not that's that's not who I am but you know she got pregnant ended up not having the baby and three years later I found out that it was from the Steelers no I that's the first time I think I said that on air so wow I'm I'm feeling better already you know hey hey, you know something what happened (laughs) what happened from that scenario as crazy as that was, and whether I should have told that or not, whatever, but a friend of mine in the music industry, I'm not going to say her names, pretty famous singer, who I'm still friends with today, had called me up and introduced me to just a new way of thinking and appreciating. And it was, it was all about the law of attraction and positive energy and how to attract things by our ways of thought in our emotions and realizing and pinpointing about everything that was going on in my life and how I was attracting all these negative things yeah. based upon where I was thought wise and emotion wise. And it all just made sense and it clicked. And from there, everything changed for the positive. Yep. You never know what turns that stuff around, you know? And I, it, you know, I, again, it's for me to share a little bit of my story with you is that uh, seven and a half years ago, I had three strokes that paralyzed me. I mean, it was, a, you talk about a fucking wake up call, but I tell you what, uh, I made a decision and I think this is what you did. I made a decision to either let the adversity destroy me 
or defined who I was going to be. And I just keep thinking that way, Ronnie. And uh, talking about defining moments, I think that you, because I feel you, I think that, that there are a lot more defining moments in your life ahead because you've got a really good uh, outlook, I think. And, and again, that's part of the reason why I want to do this show. You know, even though that I know that you're from a different walk of life, I, I like to draw the uh, sort of the comparison or correlation in whichever word is the right word. Right. And, and just to, because I learn from you and we learn from each other if we choose to do that, you know, if we make that choice. And I really, uh, with that being said, I, I really appreciate the fact that you came on uh, to the show today. I learned a hell of a lot more about you and uh, you're an interesting guy. And uh, I can't wait to do more. I can't wait for us to do our thing together and see what happens. Absolutely. I'm excited for that. Well, right. I appreciate you having me on. And um, we may have to bleep out that name just for, uh, for <laughs> safe purposes. I don't okay. want anybody coming and hunting me down. What, whatever you think. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Hey, I, you know, I'm not, I've never really done this podcasting where I'm interviewing people. I've always been the one that's talking shit all the time, you know? So, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. you know, part of my thing was like, as an interviewer, I'm trying to pull things out of you. I, I think I just did that. I'm not well, sure. Well, hey, listen, that's, that's not the only story I have. That's, that's for sure. I can tell you some stuff. You know, it, it, there, there's just a whole nother, yeah. a whole nother world out there. That's a whole nother yeah. podcast, but whatever. Anyway, yeah. listen. Um, um, some other time. Yeah, I'll talk to you soon someday, okay? Sometime Please soon. Thanks, Scott. All Appreciate right, you. take care. Bye-bye.